ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸೊ ಟುಡೇ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯಸ್ ಮಾನಿಷ ಪಂಚಕ this is the most concise expression of the fundamental principles of advaita it's almost if there were such a thing as an advaita catechism <laughs> it would be these five concepts these five beliefs or mental states shankaracharya is of course the founder of modern advaita by modern we mean about 1000 to 1200 years ago in indian history that's considered modern <laughs> so a lot of people pretend to be followers of shankaracharya but there are very few who are actually followers who can actually name these five principles panchaka means five manasa means in the mind so these five are actually states of mind they are to be realized not just known by means of words but actually lived and experienced directly you see consciousness is the only thing that can be experienced directly it's called prakash meaning directly perceived to perceive consciousness there is no need for senses a body a world the mind or any other instrument consciousness can be perceived directly by awareness so we can be aware that we're aware we can be aware that we're conscious even if there are no sense objects or senses to be conscious of and this is the unique position of consciousness once we realize this once we realize that i am consciousness alone this is the self realization this is the gnana the highest realization of vedic truth So it's very interesting the story of how these five verses these famous verses of Shankaracharya came to be spoken. And let me read it to you. Adi Shankaracharya was on his way to the temple after finishing his bath in the Ganga. He saw a chandala outcast sweeper and his four dogs on the way and told him to move away from him as was the custom. the chandala stood his ground then asked him the following questions now in india especially in the old days a brahman like shankaracharya was the highest social rank and if any of the lower castes were in his way he could ask them to move aside so that he could pass without touching them or even touching their shadows So this is the situation a chandala is an outcast that means not even a shudra even below shudra and they're generally employed as sweepers they pick up all the garbage and trash and all the mess you know anywhere in the streets and this is how they make their living but this chandala was not an ordinary chandala <laughs> because he asked some very very profound questions from the material body another material body or from consciousness consciousness o oh, best among sages which of these two do you wish to remove by saying go away go away is there any difference between the reflection of the sun in the waters of the ganga and its reflection in the water in a ditch in the quarters of the outcasts or between the space in a gold pot and in a mud pot 
What is this illusion of difference in the form, this is a Brahmana and this is an outcast, in the indwelling self, Atman, which is the ripple-free ocean of bliss and pure consciousness? So this is no <laughs> ordinary chandala. This is no ordinary street sweeper. This is a realized being speaking. Nobody but someone who is realized can put such a fine question. You know, we hear so many people claiming to be realized and acting as teachers and so on and so forth. But can they pose this kind of a question? Can they actually discriminate between what is uh, written in the books and what is actual realization? Can they actually see that the space in an earthen pot and the space in a gold pot are one and the same? See, these, these similes are extremely profound. The reflection of the sun in the water is the same, whether it's on the water of the Ganges or in the water of a ditch in the quarters of the untouchables, you see? This is because consciousness, which appears to be in the body and mind, is actually just a reflection. We went over that back in the series on Drishya Viveka. When we look at these reflections, we think, oh, the body is alive and the mind is intelligent. But no, <laughs> actually, they're merely machines, merely projections or even illusions. The real thing, the real life, is in the consciousness which is projected onto them and illuminates them from within. And the same with the space in the pot. The different pots don't matter. The space is always the same. Consciousness is just a space where things show up, a space of awareness. So it's not possible to see consciousness objectively. It can only be experienced subjectively. And this is why modern scientists can't solve the problem of consciousness. They call it the hard problem. <laughs> but for one who is simply observant and awake, it's an easy problem. On hearing these questions, Shankara realized that this despised one was actually Lord Shiva standing before him. And his four dogs were the four Vedas. Shankaracharya then went into samadhi, touched the feet of the chandala in profound respect, and burst into song, replying to the questions in five verses. The first four verses dwell on the four Mahavakyas. Prajnanam Brahma, insight is Brahman. Ayam Atma Brahman, this self, Atman, is Brahman. Tattvamasi, that thou art. Tat, the one existent. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And the fifth verse describes the state of bliss. In the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep states, that pure consciousness which shines clearly, by which one comes to know and understand things, from the creator down to the ant, that which is the very spark of life in them, as the witness of the whole universe. I am that alone, and not the objects that are seen. Firmly established in this consciousness, whether he is an outcast or a twice-born, he is my guru. This is my firm conviction. So Shankar is saying, the external situation of a living being doesn't really matter. It only matters at all if this being is unrealized. But as soon as one becomes self-realized, all these externals are simply nullified. They don't count, they don't matter. And if the greatest theorist of Advaita, Shankaracharya, is saying this, then it really carries some weight. He's saying there is no difference in the spark of life and consciousness from the creator, Lord Brahma, down to an ant, uh, or even lower, maybe, down to a stone. That consciousness is present everywhere, and it's always the same. 
The only thing that is different is whether or not we believe that the objects of consciousness are real. But actually, consciousness alone is the one thing that's existent. Everything else is illusion, appearances. I am Brahman, pure consciousness. It is pure consciousness that appears as this universe. All this is only something imagined by me due to avidya, lack of knowledge, which is composed of the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. One who has attained this definite realization about Brahman, which is bliss itself, eternal, supreme, and pure, is my guru, whether he is an outcast or twice born. This is my conviction. So the realization that one is consciousness then overrides and overcomes all other distinctions, even the distinction between the seer and the seen. Huh? Again, drishya viveka. As soon as we see that everything is consciousness, then we realize this material world doesn't really exist. If it has any existence at all, it is only as an appearance in consciousness. And this is the meaning of the Vedic Mahavakyas. He who, under the instruction of his guru, has attained the realization that the whole universe is subject to destruction, meditates on Brahman constantly with a calm and pure mind, burns his past and future sins in the fire of knowledge, and subjects himself and his body to prarabdha karma. This is my conviction. So, first of all, one should have a guru. One should not attempt self-realization without the instruction of a guru. The guru can clear so many obstacles and give so many good instructions that prevent the problems and pitfalls on the path. Then one realizes consciousness is eternal, but this whole universe is subject to destruction. Because it was created at a certain date, it's also going to be destroyed sometime in the future. So if that's the case, then what is the use of striving for a high position or extensive mystical powers or some kind of post as a demigod or something like that? Uh, existence in heaven, and so on and so forth. Because this is all going to be destroyed. Better to always meditate on Brahman. And when one does this, all of his karma is destroyed. That means the future karma. So there's no rebirth. As far as the present body, he simply allows the prarabdha karma, which is the ripened karma uh, that affects this life, to play out in the sense of destiny. And he doesn't try to change it or improve it or do anything about it. He simply accepts his fate. That pure consciousness in animals, men, and gods is experienced as I. The reflected light of the pure consciousness on the insentient mind, senses, and body make them appear sentient. The mind, the senses, and body conceal the self like the sun's radiance covered by dark clouds, yet shining forth from behind them. The yogi who always meditates on the self with a mind freed of all thoughts is indeed my guru. This is my conviction. So we've already been over how the apparent life intelligence and activity of the body and mind are simply reflections of the original consciousness. But more than that, the reason why these things appear real, all the objects in the world, including one's own body, mind, and senses, is that they cover the original radiance of pure consciousness. This is called upadi. Upadi means a restriction or a limiting adjunct, something that is not the self, but covers it and limits it and makes it appear finite. 
And finally, the self, which is Brahman, is the eternal ocean of supreme bliss. A minute fraction of that bliss is enough to satisfy Indra and other gods. By meditating on the self with a perfectly calm mind, the sage experiences fulfillment. The person whose mind has become identified with this self is not a mere knower of Brahman, but Brahman itself. Such a person, whoever he may be, is one whose feet are fit to be worshipped by Indra himself. This is my definite conviction. So the demigods are not as important as a realized jnani, whether he appears in the body of a great sage, a king, or even a chandala. Sometimes under extraordinary circumstances, even animals can become self-realized, as in the case of Ramana Maharshi's pet cow, Lakshmi. So we should understand that this self-realization, where one can simply stop the mind and meditate on pure consciousness, pure being, is the source of all bliss. Because there can't be any sorrow, there can't be any separation, there can't be any lack or any imperfection in Brahman. So this is the principles, the five principles of self-realization spoken by Shankaracharya himself, which are the basis of the whole Advaita lineage. Aung Tatsa, Aung Shakti Aung.